Good morning, everyone. Welcome to uh, this morning's special Grand Rounds. Apologies for the delay as we were having a lot of uh, echo from the Fusnellas Auditorium. So we had to last minute switch over and I brought our speaker to our room, uh, to my personal office so we can uh, overcome that problem. So apologies for the couple minutes delay there. So uh, again, once again, good morning and welcome to our special Grand Rounds. And today it's my pleasure to introduce to you uh, my friend and colleague, Dr. Judy Liu, uh, who will be speaking to us uh, in terms of her expert insights about using CMR for the investigation of patients with ischemia with non-obstructive coronary arteries. Uh, Dr. Liu is originally from Calgary, and she completed a combined MD-PhD with a doctoral focus on cardiac MRI in patients with ischemic heart disease focused on oxygenation MRI, which she was explaining to me yesterday, something I had no clue about. It was very interesting. And after she completed her adult cardiology residency at the University of Manitoba, Dr. Lu then completed specialty training in women's heart disease at the prestigious program at Cedar sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles. Upon returning from the U.S., she's currently pursuing a um, uh, master's in research methodology at McMaster University, where she's a clinical scholar, in addition to also pursuing a clinical and research MRI fellowship at the University, uh, sorry, at the Montreal Heart Institute. Her clinical and research passions are to improve the mortality and morbidity for women at risk for heart disease and to develop diagnostic approaches for microvascular dysfunction using CMR. On a more personal note, I came to know and, and meet and know Dr. Liu through the work of the Canadian Women's Heart Health Alliance, where she was voted by her peers to co-chair the advocacy working group. So in that capacity, uh, Dr. Liu has led her working group into several important women, uh, women's heart health awareness initiatives, including the 2021 iteration of the national awareness campaign that all of you should know about, so, which is Wear Red Canada. So today, once again, she's going to share with us the expert insights into the use of MRI in the management of patients with ischemia with non-obstructive coronary arteries. I'm very much looking forward to this talk, and I'd like to welcome Dr. Liu. Hello, everyone, and sorry for just let me get back into the gear of things here. Huh, how do I make my screen smaller? Uh, can everybody see my slides and hear me okay? Yes, no? Yes. Okay, great. Yeah, so thank you for the opportunity to present at your rounds this morning in Ottawa. It's been a privilege, absolute honor to be able to meet some of your team members uh, yesterday, and everyone has been extremely welcoming and very insightful. And uh, today I'd like to present on two areas that I'm very passionate about, and that includes women's heart disease and CMR. And um, as uh, Taya has mentioned, specifically on this very timely topic, facing uh, the diagnostic conundrum facing patients who have INOCA. So I have no disclosures. To begin, I'd like to start off with a case study of a 50-year-old female who presented to her cardiologist's office for chest pain. Her symptoms initially started two years ago and they would occur about two or three times a year and they've now increased in frequency and intensity over the last several months. And she endorses substernal pain that's both sharp and tight in quality and it can also radiate to her left neck. Sometimes she has tingling and paresthesia um, and uh, these episodes occur with exertion but they can also occur at rest, sometimes lasting for hours and she often has nighttime episodes that occur after midnight. Her past medical history and her current medications are as you can see below. Her vitals, physical examination and lab work at EKG in her cardiologist's office were essentially all normal. And my first question to the audience, um, there's no polling mechanism on Microsoft Teams but at audience at home and in person can just think to yourself, what would you do next? Would you order an exercise stress test, so either nuclear or echo? Would you B, order a coronary angiogram, an invasive or CT? Would you C, order a stress CMR or PET? Or would you D, send her home with nitroglycerin and follow up in two or three months? <laughs> 
So over the course of a few months, she continues to return with angina. And as you can see, um, multiple cardiac investigations were ordered by her cardiologist and they included a nuclear stress test, a transthoracic echo, a coronary CT angio, and even an ex a repeat exercise treadmill test. And you can see from the slides I've shown with her results that they were essentially, again, all normal. And so at this point, I'd like to poll the audience and ask you, now what would you do? Would you A, suspect that this is non-cardiac chest pain, you reassure her, and you recommend that she follow up with her family doctor? Would you B, order additional alternative cardiac investigations, and if so, think to yourself, what would that be? Or would you C, refer her to your internal medicine colleagues to rule out other potential causes like pulmonary or GI-related uh, conditions? Would you D, add a beta blocker and follow up in two or three months? And then finally, E, it's okay to not be sure what's going on, and you can say, I'm not sure what to do next. Yeah, so do think to yourself, and we will um, for sure return back to this case later on. So my objectives for today's talk are threefold. You know, firstly, I'd like to summarize the current understanding of INOCA related to its prevalence, prognosis, and underlying mechanisms. My second uh, objective is to describe the diagnostic approach for this condition and specifically focusing on the role of CMR. And then finally, I will end with outlining the future I envision for these two emerging and very interconnected fields of research. So for decades, the primary focus when managing patients with angina has been to verify coronary atherosclerosis and flow limiting disease. But in recent years, a new paradigm has emerged for ischemic heart disease. And as you can see from this figure, INOCA is a recently proposed umbrella term that conveys the importance of stable coronary syndromes beyond obstructive coronary artery disease. And INOCA aligns with its sibling term, MINOCA, so MI with no obstructive coronary artery disease, which is also a very diverse syndrome with distinct underlying causes. But for today's uh, presentation, I will focus mostly on the stable coronary counterpart of INOCA. So in its most simplest term, INOCA is a condition where patients present with symptoms and or signs of ischemia, but they're subsequently found to not have any obstructive coronary artery disease. And non-obstructive coronary arteries can be found in as many as two thirds and one third of men, two thirds of women and one third of men who undergo uh, coronary, in clinically indicated coronary angiography. And as you can see from this graph to the right, from a large Danish cohort of over 11,000 patients, the proportion of those who have no obstructive coronary artery disease in both genders is increasing. And using the Women's Ischemia Syndrome Evaluation, or the WISE study, patients with ischemia were found, patients with INOCA were found to have a high burden of angina, with as much as 30% having persistent moderate to severe symptoms at one year. And these angial symptoms can vary broadly, so they can range from abdominal pain to generalized weakness or shoulder pain. And it's also important to recognize that there's a race and ethnicity difference. So black women tend to report more stomach-related pain when compared to white Caucasians who report more chest symptoms. Again, data from the Y study have shown that compared to asymptomatic patients, women with INOCA are up to six times, they have up to six times increased risk of major adverse cardiovascular events, and that's independent of traditional risk factors. And there's also a five times increased risk for repeat angiography and hospitalization. And so to reiterate, INOCA is not benign. Researchers have previously demonstrated that our commonly used risk scores like the Framingham risk score or in the US where I did my training, the ASCVD risk score, they do actually do not accurately assess. And in fact, they tend to underestimate the risk for cardiovascular disease in these patients. So really, these patients should be considered at higher risk when seen in your preventative clinics. <laughs> 
So multiple net mechanisms can contribute to myocardial ischemia beyond coronary stenosis that um, nicely illustrated in this figure. And they can include things like platelet um, coagulation disorders, systemic inflammation or autoimmune disease like lupus, myocardial bridging, and so forth. But for today's talk, I will focus specifically on disorders of coronary vasomotor dysfunction, and that includes microvascular dysfunction and vasospasm. So coronary vasomotor dysfunction is very common, as you can uh, see illustrated in this diagram. It can be identified as the underlying cause of ischemia in as much as 60 to 90% of patients with INOCA, and that includes the sequelae of microvascular angina and vasospastic angina. And as you can see depicted in this figure, microvascular dysfunction and vasospasm, while they are distinct conditions, they can cause ischemia in patients with non-obstructive as well as obstructive disease. And they can also overlap, resulting in a mixed phenotype. So this mixed phenotype makes INOCA very heterogeneous and often very uh, difficult condition to diagnose. So now let's shift gear to the pathophysiology of INOCA from our current understanding. So shown to the right here, you can see that uh, extensive coronary arterial system. It's a vast network of vessels that range in various sizes with distinct function, with the endothelium forming the intima and the media that's comprised of your vascular smooth muscle cells. So the coronary microvasculature make up most of the blood volume um, and resistance in the heart, and it's responsible for the dynamic regulation of blood flow through the control of hormone and sympathetic tone. And there are a number of structural changes or microvascular remodeling modeling that have been associated with CMD. And these can include things like diffuse atherosclerosis, abnormal intimal thickening, and adverse changes in your capillary integrity. And then furthermore, CMD can also result from a variable combination of impaired vasodilation, so owing to endothelial dependent and endothelial independent mechanism. It can also be caused by increased vasoconstriction caused by various stimuli like endothelium 1 and acetylcholine. And when we think of the pathogenesis of vasospasm, while it's not fully yet understood, um, it's thought to be due to an interplay between endothelial dysfunction and vascular smooth muscle cell hyperreactivity. And what do I mean by that? So in the healthy endothelium, acetylcholine releases nitric oxide and it mediates vascular smooth muscle relaxation and increases blood flow. But when you have high doses or in patients who have endothelial dysfunction, acetylcholine directly stimulates your vascular smooth muscle cell to precipitate vasoconstriction, and this can lead to microvascular epicardial spasm. So it's postulated that endothelial dysfunction is actually potentially a precursor to coronary vasospasm. So one of the goals, therefore, when we're thinking of the diagnostic approach for INOCA is to determine, firstly, if there is underlying microvascular dysfunction. So at Cedar sinai the approach first involves ruling out secondary causes of microvascular dysfunction. These can include things like valvular heart disease, ruling out myocardial disorders like uh, dilated hypertrophic cardiomyopathies, and then after that, we then uh, proceed with a conservative strategy of offering the patient empirical therapy, and that includes things like um, aspirin, ACE inhibitors for endothelial improvement, and vasodilating beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, etc. But upon follow-up, if there are persistent symptoms, we proceed to non-invasive imaging to assess coronary flow reserve using modalities like PET or CMR. But it's important to note that a negative stress test does not rule out microvascular dysfunction. You can see from this table that in patients who have angina with no obstructive CAD, the traditional non-invasive tests like stress echo, nuclear, they were shown to have very limited diagnostic accuracy for detecting coronary vasomotor dysfunction when compared to the reference standard of invasive coronary function testing, which we'll talk about later on. So the sensitivity and the specificity of these traditional non-invasive stress tests for predicting um, CMD are actually very poor. And I stress that it's PET with no CFR measurements. <laughs> 
So I'll now switch gears and spend the next portion of the presentation highlighting the role of CMR in providing a very comprehensive assessment of patients who are suspected of having INOCA. So the assessment of INOCA, again, like I mentioned before, begins with ruling out secondary causes like cardiomyopathies or severe valvular heart disease. So in order to do this, CMR can provide very accurate assessment of both function, size, volumetrics, functional parameters. But we should recognize the limitations of our current normal reference values, which are very outdated. Um, it uh, was uh, um, resulted from a very small heterogeneous sample of patients that range from 60 to 120 participants. And anatomically, we know that sex and age contribute significantly to variations in the heart and disease phenotype. And so it can really influence the accuracy of your diagnostic imaging. And so I'd like to highlight a recent study that we published with Sonia Anand out of McMaster and Matisse Friedrich out of McGill using their very large cohort of patients from the Canadian Alliance of Healthy Hearts and Minds of over 3,000 individuals that were used to derive a new robust set of sex and age-specific normal reference values for CMR. And to illustrate the importance of sex on your ventricular size and function, I have an example here, hypothetical. So in severe mitral regurgitation, the guideline recommendation threshold for LV and systolic dimensions is 40 millimeters. And this roughly equates to a threshold of about 70 millimeters uh, milliliters, right, by your Tycho's formula on echo. And as you can see from the table, the normal reference value for N systolic volume are significantly different for the male and the female by nearly 15 milliliters. So you think the 15 milliliters may not be that much. If you wait until 70 milliliters for the male when his normal ventricle is 55 milliliters, then that's a 30% dilation of his left ventricle. But for the female, if you're waiting until 70 milliliters as recommended by the guidelines, when her normal ventricle is actually 40 milliliters, then that's an almost 70% dilation of her ventricle. And by that point, you may have actually missed the boat for surgical intervention if you're using the same cutoff for males and females. And so microvascular dysfunction is associated with reduced perfusion reserve that can be exploited by CMR. So within the coronary circulation, CMD results in a lack of appropriate coronary vasodilation in response to adenosine-induced hyperemia. And this leads to an impairment of myocardial blood flow during stress and a subsequent imbalance between oxygen demand and supply. So using CMR, we can quantify this myocardial perfusion reserve as a marker for microvascular dysfunction. So using first pass perfusion imaging in the WISE cohort of approximately 118 patients who underwent invasive coronary function testing, calculations of myocardial perfusion reserve index, as you can see to the right, oops, sorry, um, of less than 1.84 predicted those who had microvascular dysfunction with a sensitivity and specificity of both over 70% respectively. And also using late gadolinium enhancement um, in CMR when you inject the patient with contrast dye to look at areas of scar, they've shown that there's, these patients can also have a typical and atypical patterns of scar in women with INOCA who particularly did not have any prior diagnosis, uh, diagnosis of MI at all. And another approach that can potentially be used for uh, to sorry to image microvascular dysfunction or coronary vasomotor disorders is called oxygenation sensitive CMR. And this was the focus of my doctoral studies at the University of Calgary and ongoing research um, interest now at McGill. So in the early 1990s, uh, researchers developed a technique in functional imaging of the brain, and this technique generated um, contrast through blood oxygenation. And because this technique did not use any contrast agents or radiation, it was generally considered a safer and more direct method to detect areas with reduced oxygenation. So the technique at that time was called blood oxygen level dependent or BOLD. 
and it relies on the different properties of oxygenated versus deoxygenated hemoglobin. And as you can see from this skim, uh, simple schematic, when a magnetic field is applied to oxygenated hemoglobin, the field is homogeneous. But in comparison, when you have a deoxygenated hemoglobin, the applied magnetic field becomes inhomogeneous. And so bold sensitive or oxygenation sensitive CMR, therefore can exploit this paramagnetic property of deoxygenated hemoglobin for use as an endogenous contrast agent. And so this diagram actually summarizes the concept of OSCMR very nicely. And as you can see, when you have an applied magnetic field, the different susceptibilities of oxygenated versus deoxygenated hemoglobin creates different signal intensities in the tissue that you're sampling. And this can be quantified using imaging software. So when you have reduced oxygenation, the image is darker, reduced signal intensity. When it's uh, higher oxygenation, the images are brighter with higher intensity. And we previously demonstrated the potential clinical utility of OSCMR to assess adenosine-induced changes in microoxygenation when compared to the reference standard of fractional flow reserve in the cath lab. So in this study, we prospectively recruited 64 patients with suspected or known coronary artery disease who were undergoing clinically indicated invasive angiography. And using our oxygenation sensitive sequence, we demonstrated that a signal intensity of less than approximately 5% identified an FFR of less than 0.8, as you can see, both with a sensitivity and specificity above 85%. You can see in the raw images of OSCMR shown to the left, we have the baseline, the post adenosine post um, needs to be post processed, but um, and then that's compared to a representative polar map illustrating an abnormal signal intensity in the anterior and anterior lateral segments that correlated with a severe stenosis of the LED um, on invasive corneal angiography, and FFR at that time was measured to be 0 0.49, which is abnormal. An FFR of less than 0 0.8 is, is considered abnormal. And subsequently, in another study we published using OCMR, we showed that compared to young and healthy um, individual controls, patients who had established coronary artery disease had a nearly 50% blunted response to adenosine, and that importantly, this blunted response was also seen in participants with only risk factors, but no clinical evidence of coronary artery disease. And we also found that the subendocardium was more affected than the subepicardium, even in patients who had only risk factors and no evidence of CAD. And so these findings of having localized perfusion defects to the subendocardium, we hypothesized may be related to underlying microvascular dysfunction. And this was similarly reported in previous patients in the, in the 1990s in cardiac syndrome X, which is the previous name, uh, which is the, the old uh, historical name for microvascular dysfunction. And our current research endeavor now is to eliminate the use of contrast and adenosine altogether with a simple hyperventilating breathing maneuver, and we couple this with our OSCMR uh, protocol. So in a nutshell, um, similar to effects in the brain, the coronary vasculature is known to have a very strong response to breathing maneuvers. And as you can see illustrated in this diagram to the left, the decrease in CO2 during hyperventilation induces coronary vasoconstriction with a subsequent reduction in myocardial blood flow, volume, and myocardial oxygenation. And when you follow this with apnea or voluntary breath hold, this leads to vasodilation followed by a strong increase in coronary blood flow. This, um, di this uh, video to the right is just an illustration of this, uh, uh, sorry, a video of this very simple breathing maneuver that we perform at uh, McGill. And in our, so I, I apologize uh, ahead of time for this uh, low resolution figure, but um, it demonstrates, so in our most recent um, uh, publication of preliminary data from our research group using OSCMR in 20 women who um, were found to have INOCA compared to 20 h match healthy volunteers. This entirely non-invasive uh, novel CMR approach demonstrated a very distinctive pattern of increased regional heterogeneity rather than a global um, reduction in myocardial oxygenation changes in patients in women who had INOCA. And again, this is consistent with previously uh, 
reported evidence of ischemia in CMR being localized to the subendocardium or appearing patchy throughout the myocardium, suggestive of a pathophysiology of potentially microvascular dysfunction. And most recently, we hypothesized that OSCMR can evaluate different forms of vascular, uh, sort of coronary vascular dysfunction by identifying specific patterns of myocardial oxygenation over the cardiac cycle. And we coined this term myocardial oxygenation signature. You can see in this figure that these are end systolic short axis views of the heart, and it corresponds to this. Uh, segmental time intensity curve of myocardial oxygenation or the signatures across the cardiac cycle in both a healthy volunteer and a patient shown to the right who has severe coronary artery disease. You can see that the blue area indicates an abnormally strong deoxygenation or low signal intensity. And analogous to an EKG with defined parameters for each phase of the cardiac cycle, when you have perturbations that deviate from the normal EKG, you can routinely and very easily identify various disease states, uh, disease states so including ischemia, acute MI, et cetera. So in collaboration with one of our um, industry partners using advanced machine learning techniques, we are now working to develop myocardial oxygenation signatures that can distinguish different disease pathologies across the spectrum of ischemic heart disease. So let's take you back to the case study. So this 50-year-old uh, female who had persistent symptoms was placed on appropriate therapies with statin for having an elevated ASCVD risk score. She was also put on ACE inhibitor and vasodilating beta blockers, including uh, such as uh, including carvedilol. But she did return with persistent pain, and so we decided to proceed with a non-invasive imaging using stress CMR at Cedars. And this did indeed show an abnormal perfusion of MPRI of less than 1.84 with no evidence of late gadolinium enhancement. So she at that time, we speculated, had microvascular dysfunction. But in some cases, however, it may not be that straightforward. And when we still have clinical equipoise, the role of invasive coronary function testing should be pursued to better define the underlying etiology. And what do I mean by coronary, uh, so invasive coronary function testing? So it's a procedure that's performed in the cath lab, and this is the approach that's outlined at Cedar sinai um, It can be summarized in three steps, as you can see here. So it's much more complicated than this, but for the audience, I will, um, in simple terms, explain it here. So in the first step, we rule out obstructive epicardial stenosis with a diagnostic angiogram. And at that same time, we can also assess for myocardial bridging and or increased nociception, which is the sensation of increased pain despite having minimal manipula manipulation with the coronary wire. And in step two, we assess for coronary vasorelaxation relaxation through the use of a Doppler-tipped guide wire and intracoronary injections of adenosine. And this tests for non-endothelial-dependent microvascular um, dysfunction using a measurement of coronary flow reserve. And then finally, in step three, we specifically evaluate for the propensity for coronary vasoconstriction using acetylcholine provocation. So we can remember my previous slide about the mechanism of, of, microvas of a coronary vasospasm. When you have an endothel healthy endothelium, acetylcholine stimulates the release of nitric oxide, and this mediates vascular smooth muscle cell relaxation, subsequent in increase in your blood flow. But when you have high doses of acetylcholine or in patients who have endothelial dysfunction, that acetylcholine actually directly stimulates your vascular smooth muscle cell to, vas to cause vasoconstriction. And this we postulate uh, precipitates to epicardial vasospasm or microvascular um, vasospasm induced ischemia. And this table summarizes the different pathways for INOCA that we target with coronary uh, function testing. So it's not meant to be memorized, but it's really meant to illustrate the heterogeneous um, pathways that INOCA, patients with INOCA can present with. It can be non endothelial dependent, endothelial dependent, micro macrovascular dysfunction. It can also be coronary vasospasm, both micro and macrovascular dysfunction. So when you look at an individual who has a suspected INOCA in front of you, it's really potentially not that simple. And importantly, again, in their WISE cohort, uh, they've shown that invasive measures of microvascular uh, function predicts adverse cardiovascular 
outcomes. And so specifically, they've shown that for every 0.1 decrease in your coronary flow reserve, that was associated with an 8% increase in the risk of of excessive mace. And then every 10% decrease in your coronary blood flow in response to acetylcholine, that was associated with a 23% increase in your risk of all cause mortality and 16% excess risk for mace. So let's go back to our case. So after three months, she returned for follow-up with improved symptoms, but occasionally will get um, debilitating chest pain. So in discussion with the patient, we proceeded to do uh, to perform invasive coronary function testing in the cath lab. I didn't perform it, but uh, we helped set the procedures and then the interventional uh, cardiologist, we would guide them in terms of the experiment. And so I'm showing these coronary angiograms and you can see at baseline, um, these are her coronaries, relatively normal. And when she was given the high dose acetylcholine, you can see you can see right away that she had epicardial coronary vasospasm and that matched with her symptoms on the cath table. And following that, when she was given nitroglycerin as rescue, um, increased vasodilation, re return of coronary blood flow, um, her coronaries returned to normal. And so this patient had both microvascular dysfunction and coronary vasospasm. As, as her underlying etiology for her INOCA. And so now I'd like to spend just very brief time on the future direction and where I see these areas of research going and uh, where we're trying to go and where I envision it. And so I'm showing this uh, diagram here. It's a figure that of a CIHR uh, grant that we recently submitted to evaluate the clinical utility of OSCMR across the spectrum of both macrovascular and microvascular dysfunction in those we suspect to have suspected coronary disease or INOCA. And we want to demonstrate the clinical utility of these myocardial oxygenation signatures. And in this figure, just very briefly, we have three sets of experiments and we want to evaluate the diagnostic accuracy of the myocardial oxygenation signatures, as well as determine its prognostic or predictive value of, of outcomes at both one and three year follow up. And importantly, in the uh, second arm of our experiments, we are also collaborating with our international collaborators at Cedar sinai you, uh, with so Noel Barry Mers, U Florida with Carl Capine, and as well as our um, other uh, uh, collaborators in the University of Ohio Christ Hospital, Tim Henry's, to compare the oxygenation signatures in cohort of INOCA patients against the reference standard invasive function testing. And so we really want to, so we hypothesize actually that patients with INOCA will have a very heterogeneous myth patholo mixed pathology, it can be due to endothelium, non endothelial, micro macrovascular dysfunction, coronary vasospasm. And we really want to showcase that. Um, using these myocardial signatures, we'll be able to uh, define and more deeply phenotype these different disease pathways, but in a much more non-invasive, non-contrast, uh, no radiation, no stress agent uh, way. And I have here this one last slide. Again, another potential uh, path forward is to compare OSCMR to that of PET, which obviously the University of Ottawa and here at the Ottawa Hunts Heart Institute, you guys are world experts in PET validation studies. And so we've never compared OSCMR and validated our findings to that of PET. And it would be a very interesting experimental uh, uh, endeavor to uh, enroll patients who have INOCA or potentially other ischemic heart disease and really demonstrate demonstrate uh, the diagnostic accuracy of both of OSCMR against that of PET as a reference standard. So in conclusion, um, I want to reiterate again that INOCA is not a benign condition. It comes with increased risk for adverse cardiovascular events, as I've shown. And CMR, specifically these um, novel diagnostic approaches that I've demonstrated, can be used to diagnose microvascular dys dysfunction, it can, and it can also help guide our management in patients who are suspected of having INOCA. But I stress that when clinical equipoise remains, um, the clinician, if uh, it's available, the expertise is available, should consider pursuing invasive coronary function testing to better discern the underlying etiology of the patient in front of you.
just I'd like to acknowledge uh, my colleagues at McGill University for their tremendous help and mentorship over the many years. And it's just a picture. I wasn't there at this time, but of um, of all of our research uh, team members at the CMR Center at McGill. And now I'd like to open up for questions. I see Dr. Taya is here, so let me stop sharing screen. Do you think you could? Oh, yeah, there you go. Yeah, let me. Um, OK, go ahead. All right, just came and joined uh, Dr. Lou here in my office again, uh, since Bruce Nellis has too much.